What actually is a sabre? And was I wrong? Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatorian. Now, many, many years ago, I made a video where I ranted about the fact that people referred to straight sword, certain types of straight sword, as a sabre based on the design of the hilt. Now, rightly so, some of my non-British, shall we say, colleagues, um, particularly those functioning in other languages such as French, pointed out to me that I was maybe wrong. Now, before we delve into that and unpack it, let's just accept for a second, I think most people in the world would accept that what I'm holding here is to 99.9% .9 of people who know anything about swords, this is a sabre. There are certainly some swords which undeniably we can call a sabre. They've got a curved blade, they've got a single edge blade, they've got a certain type of guard. Now, are those three things critical to what we call a sabre. So first of all, let's look at the curvature of the blade. And that's the biggest topic here. I think most people would go, and I myself in the past have gone, it is not a sabre if it's straight. Well, is that really true? Well, let's pick up here a Victorian Wilkinson, Victorian officer's sabre. Is it a sabre? Well, it looks like a sabre, and I would even refer to this as a sabre, and a lot of Victorian people would refer to this as a sabre, but if we look down the blade, it is absolutely blooming straight. It is straight as an arrow. And this is literally on the Wilkinson ledger. It says straight blade. So as far as they were concerned, this was an infantry officer's sword. Some of them were slightly curved, some of them were very curved, some of them were straight, and the officer could decide. It didn't really make any difference to them as a manufacturer, and it didn't necessarily make any difference to what they called it. They just called it a curved blade. Sometimes they might perhaps use the word sabre for a curved blade. But they also referred to sabres as things with straight blades. And on that topic, what we've got here is a French infantry officer's sabre from pretty much the same period. Or is it a sabre? Look at that blade. Absolutely blooming straight. And this is the cannula uh, 1882 pattern blade that in fact had been around uh, particularly in use amongst North African army officers um, <coughs> for some decades previously but it is more of a dedicated thrusting blade you can cut with these and actually they they cut quite nicely uh, they don't cut with enormous amount of power because obviously they don't have the breadth to it uh, they don't have the curvature which can assist with cuts in certain ways um, and again other videos will deal with that uh, unpacking that particular statement um, but nevertheless this is a straight blade and in French nomenclature this would be referred to as a sabre, not only in terms of the object itself, but also in terms of the method of use. And we're going to come back to that uh, towards the end of the video. But not just the French. Don't think I'm just talking about the French. Also the Italians. So clearly there are several different words for sabre. So where's the, where's the etymology? Where does the word come from? Well, sabre, the ultimate roots of it are somewhat debated, but certainly we've got the word shabla in Polish, um, and we've got shabola in Italian, we've got sab in French, and sabre is just a copy of the French word spelt exactly the same way. And then for some reason known only, only to the Americans themselves, they decided to change the spelling of it. Despite the fact they copied the French in most military things, they decided to change the spelling to sabre, a E-R at the end, um, but said the same way and basically with its root in the French. Um, Sabel uh, in German. So basically all of these are the same word for similar weapons and it does seem that at their earliest conception they usually referred to curved weapons but already quite early on and certainly by the 19th century the word saber was also applied to straight blades. So in France this would be referred to as a saber. In Italy there are many straight models of sword that are referred to as sabre. And in fact, if we look at fencing treatises, they refer to broadsword and sabre. We'll come back to the broadsword term in a second. They refer to broadsword and sabre as interchangeable things. The method of use is the same, uh, and even the object can be the same. So uh, a 1796 light cavalry sabre, although it's broad and curved, can be referred to, amazingly, in period sources of the 18th, late 18th and early 19th century, as a broadsword or a sabre. Um, so, they weren't that bothered about it. The word broadsword, sabre, were interchangeable. Funnily enough, similar, if we go back to the 18th century and even the early 1700s, uh, possibly even the 1600s actually, the late 1600s, the words broadsword and backsword, and sometimes short sword, were also interchangeable and synonymous. So if we go back to the Elizabethan era, the word short sword 
often actually meant a basket-hilted broadsword, and some of those were single-edged and referred to as a backsword, but by the 18th century, backsword was also referred to as a method of single-stick fencing applied to any of the basket-hilted swords. Oh, you can see how complicated this gets. So, in the 18th century in Britain, backsword can refer to a whole bunch of cut and thrust swords. In the 19th century in Britain, France, Spain, Italy, America, loads of countries, Germany, sabre can refer to a whole bunch of cut and thrust swords. In fact, they also have this term contre contrepoint, um, excuse my French, uh, contrepoint uh, in French, which means against point or, or the opposite of a point fencing. So, in other words, um, sabre fencing. Okay, so contrepoint in, in French uh, essentially means uh, sabre fencing. Okay, now, and uh, as I mentioned, in British and English and other Anglo uh, countries, sabre fencing could often refer to something with a straight blade. And in fact, of course, we shouldn't ignore the fact that in the modern Olympics and all, all the way back to 1906, and I think before that, most fencing sabres have straight blades, not curved blades. So, so if something with a straight blade can be a saber, then what about this? What about this French cuirassier's palache? Why has this got its own word palache? Well, I would argue that's because this is a distinct enough object. Anybody who picks up this straight bladed infantry officer's sword, or this straight bladed French infantry officer's sword, or this Indian cavalry saber, they're roughly in the similar ballpark in terms of how they handle and how you use them. However, how this handles and how this is used, because it's got such a whopping great blade that is primarily designed for thrusting and you can hit someone really, really hard with, but it's not really designed for cutting, and it's a big heavy sword, this is a distinctly different type of specifically heavy cavalry object. So this does get, does get its own name, Palash, but you will find period sources which might refer to these as a sabre. And again, it's as straight as an arrow. And you will notice, just to di divert for a second from the main topic, that this is very similar to the whole rapier topic. So, is this a rapier? Is this a military rapier? Is this a side sword? Is this a broadsword? These are all interchangeable terms, and I often talk about these, uh, the problems of term terminology with medieval and renaissance periods, but we also have the problem of terminology in the 21st century, and they had the problem in the 19th century as well. Now, when we come to something like this, again, it's a bit like the cuirassier sword, this is what most people would call a spadroon, much loved of this channel, of course. Could we call this a sabre? Well, funnily enough, no, and there's a historical reason for why. So this is a Georgian era sword, it dates to about uh, 1780s, uh, po possibly 1790s, okay? So this is a, a sword from the period before sabres became really, really popular in Western Europe, okay? So in uh, France, England, Spain, Italy, at that point there were a lot of types of military broadsword and backsword and spadroon and small sword in use, but sabres weren't quite yet the massively popular swords that they were during the Napoleonic Wars, very topical at the moment with the Ridley Scott movie. So, the word sabre seems to have come into Western European usage to apply to a whole bunch of cut and thrust swords after the Napoleonic Wars, because sabres during that period, the end of the 1700s, had become so universal and so universally popular and used by light cavalry and infantry officers and loads of people all over Europe, not just people in Poland, not just people in Hungary or Russia, but also it was now used right the way across Europe by loads of different troop types, curved swords that is. And so the word sabre came into common usage, and then as blades got straighter again, and in some cases got absolutely straight, the word sabre stuck in the language. Equally, here's another sword which has come into my possession recently, and this is an interesting one, and we're going to talk about usage now. So this is a 17th century sword, it's a little bit like a Walloon hilt, but it's an English version probably, could possibly be German, but it's probably English, and this is a type of sword that was in use just after the English Civil War, probably dates to about 1660, um, and it, so it's post mortuary hilt, uh, but it's pre... Um, it's before a lot of the sort of 18th century designs that, that you might be familiar with. So it's, it's a sort of hybrid design, it's got these added sidebars here which almost hark back to mortuary hilts, but they're just at the top. 
and there are no side bars here like you might get on a full basket hilt. This means this blade is double-edged, incidentally, it's not single-edged, it is straight. It's a double-edged, essentially narrow broadsword blade. It's 34 and a half inches, more or less, long. Um, and it has a hilt that you can hold because of the length of the hilt. It even has a shaped hilt that has a flat back on the back of the wooden grip, which has lost the wire wrap. Um, you can hold it and use it in exactly the same ways and positions as you'd use a 19th century sabre. So if you're holding a, a 19th century officer's sword like this, and then you pick up this, in your hand, there's almost no difference. You can use it in the same way, you can hold it in the same way, it thrusts pretty much the same, it cuts pretty much the same, it weighs about the same, it balances about the same. So they're extremely similar swords. Now, what's interesting about that is we come back to the usage, and if we look at manuals and treatises, of the 19th century, and in fact, even into the 20th century. When we look at sabre fencing, whether it's military sources from the Napoleonic period at the earliest point, if we go all the way forwards to military manuals in the 1880s and 1890s, or if we look at sporting manuals, of course, as we get into the early Olympics in the beginning of the 1900s, sabre is essentially any cut and thrust sword that is, can be curved, but is very often straight. Now, I do just want to give some credit to the idea that the term sabre is partly, well, it's very subjective, but it's partly decided on the style of the hilt. Because admittedly, some people would call this a sabre, completely justifiably. But if we took this blade and put it onto this hilt, then almost nobody would call that a sabre anymore. Most people would call it a spadroon. Or indeed, we could take this uh, Wilkinson straight backsword blade here, take it off this sabre hilt and put it on a basket hilt, and almost everybody who knows about swords would refer to it as a backsword. <laughs> now we could take this sword here, which is double-edged, and we could take that blade and put it on this Wilkinson hilt, and almost everybody would call it a sabre but with its original 17th century hilt, almost nobody would call it a sabre, even if you can use it in pretty much the same way as a sabre, and functionally, it's pretty much the same as a sabre. With that hilt with a double shell guard and a knuckle bow with those little ribs at the side, nobody would call that a sabre. Even though the guard protects the same part of your hand in the same way, you wouldn't call it a sabre. A lot of people would call this a walloon hilt or something like this, or a double shell guard, whatever. Um, if you took this blade and put it on a basket hilt, everybody would call it a basket hilted broadsword. If you took this blade and stuck it on the spadroon hilt, people would call it a spadroon. You see where I'm going here. The naming of swords is incredibly complex. It's not worth arguing about because it's incredibly subjective, okay? When you decide what is a sabre and whether to call something a sabre or not, it will be partly based on when you are, where you are, who you are, what the style of hilt is, the exact details of the blade, what method of fencing it's used with and things like this. Because let's remember at the end of the day, if we just say that a sabre is any curved sword, then this shamshir is a sabre. But just about anybody who uses swords would refer to this only as a shamshir. Okay, because this is a particularly Persian, Indo-Persian design, and it's used in Indo-Persian systems. This would not be used like you would use a Victorian infantry officer's sabre, which is straight. So here we've got something that almost everybody would call a sabre, which is straight, and here we've got something which really most people shouldn't call a sabre, should call it a shamshir, but it's curved. Now, some of you out there, particularly the French speakers out there, will be pointing out that the katana, <laughs> we'll just grab one of those quickly, the katana is known in, uh, in France as the sabre japonaise. Um, so it is the Japanese sabre. But why? Funnily enough, not all katana are curved. Some katana, katana are straight. And as we've established, the French themselves often called straight swords sabres, including fencing versions. So why did they call this the sab japonaise? Uh, my belief is it's because in the context of thrusting swords, this is a cut and thrust sword. So I think for many people in the 19th century, when these were being called sab japonaise, which has come into modern French as well, it's because this is a cutting sword. So essentially it is a hangover. The word, for many people anyway, certainly for the French, the, uh, the word sabre is a hangover word terminology from the 19th century, 
to differentiate a cut and thrust sword from a thrusting sword. So epe in fencing just means sword. If we look in medieval sources, epe means any type of sword. But in fencing, an epe is specifically a thrusting sword, a straight thrusting sword. Whereas the sabre, the sabre, is a cut and thrust sword. Doesn't matter whether it's curved or straight. So there we go, uh, a very mixed up, not black and white, many, many shades of gray uh, answer to the question. What is or isn't a saber? It's whatever you want to call a saber. But there are some things which are more clearly sabers than others. Um, you know, that I think just about everybody will agree is a saber. I think almost everybody in the world would call that a saber. I think very few people in the world would call that a saber even though functionally you can use it exactly like a sabre. Um, and as for whether you agree to call something like this uh, French 1882, or it's actually a North African version, a pre, it's a pre-1882, whether you want to call this a sabre or not, really, really depends on nuanced, um, subjective, personal life choices. Personally, I have actually changed. And this is why I would say, was I wrong? I wasn't wrong, but I've changed my stance on this. I would now, based on studying the 19th century sources in context that I have, I would now refer to this as a sabre, even though it's primarily a thrusting sword uh, that is straight. I would call this a sabre because the French at the time did call this a sabre. I hope that's been thought provoking. If you massively disagree, that's completely fine. You're allowed to do that here. Um, get posting in the comments down below if you can think of other examples. Are they a sabre? Are they not a sabre? Do you disagree? Which points do you disagree with? Other topics you'd like to see me tackle or retackle or correct from the past or new things I've never tackled before. I hope I'll see you back on the channel really soon. I have been Matt Easton and I will continue to be. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers folks.